Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being there for us in the middle of fear, in the middle of terror, in the middle of whatever scares us or terrifies us. Thank you because you are greater than whatever comes at us. And thank you because you have overcome evil. May you hide me in you today and may your voice speak to all of our hearts, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever been afraid? Scared out of your mind and feeling like your heart is going to pop out of your chest? I have. And if you have, you and I can relate. Because you and I are in good company. See, fear entered when Adam and Eve made that choice in the garden. So Adam and Eve feared. And Moses, after he killed that soldier and had to run into the wilderness, he feared. And Jacob, when he had to run for his life. And then Joseph, when he was thrown in the pit and sold in slavery by his brothers. And Elijah, after he brought down fire from heaven, he ran. He ran because a wicked king was seeking to kill him. And the disciples, the disciples, when they were in the garden and Jesus was sold, they feared. So you see, you and I are in good company. And that is what I want to talk to you about The fact that from the beginning of time, Satan has tried so hard to paralyze us, to arrest our hearts with fear. But at the same time, there is a God in heaven who has promised us in Psalm 46. And can you read it with me? Psalm 46 that says, God, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Can you read it with me? Though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the seas, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. That is the God that we serve. A God who has promised us to be with us when we face fear, when fear comes right smack in my face and in your face. And that's the kind of God I want to talk to you about. Not a God who removes us from facing fear, but a God who promised he will always be with us no matter the fear. That's the God that we serve today. And that's the God that I want to share about this morning with you. I was born locked behind the Iron Curtain in the communist country of Romania under the regime of Nicolae Ceausescu, who was one of the worst dictators that had ever lived. The borders were locked. No one can come in or go out. Christians were tortured. They were thrown in prison. And I don't know if any one of you have heard the voice of the martyrs and the story of Richard Wurbrand, who was actually throughout uh, the United States, had actually had a movie, Tortured for Christ, this past week. Two Christians were tortured because they believed in God. And so I grew up in a family who loved God, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian family. And since I was little, I had heard the stories that my grandmother and my mother would teach me. The story of Joseph was one of my favorite ones. Fear, my friends, in the country of Romania was the topic of the day. One out of three, look, look around you, the person next to you or the person between you maybe an informant. One out of three was an informant. No one knew who to fear and who to trust, including in the Seventh-day Adventist church, including in all of the churches. The weak, 
the school week was six days a week. So if you were a Christian, you had a target on your back, but especially if you were a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you had even a bigger target because if you chose not to attend school on Sabbath, you were mocked, you were bullied, you were marginalized. And so at age nine, in the third grade, I chose to not go to school on Sabbath, but go to cho chose to go to church. And out of that came a barrage of bullying, a barrage of, of mocking. But you know what? Even though those things were happening, even though I was made fun of, even though I was called names that I couldn't even utter, nothing compared to the day when I heard my father and I heard my father sob after he picked up the phone and began crying uncontrollably and actually dropped to the floor saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. I didn't know who was alive. I didn't know what happened. What could have been so dangerous that my father would sob and drop to the ground? It was in those moments that I began to hear what had happened and what had transpired and the plan that my family had concocted for us to escape communist Romania. You see, my uncle had been con contacted by the Romanian Securitate, which was the Romanian KGB, and was told or was asked to be an informant. He asked them to give him a couple of days because if he was refusing them outright, he and his family would be killed. In those days, he connected with a friend who had another friend who lived on the border of what was then Yugoslavia, right at the border of the Blue Danube. He paid that man a large sum of money in the hopes that he can be trusted. And in the middle of the night, that this man would lower him in the Danube, and when the night shifting of the guards would change, my uncle, who had been a weightlifting coach, would actually swim across for several miles into what was then Yugoslavia. For an entire week, my family had no idea if he was dead or alive until that night when that phone call came. He had walked for days, we would later find out, walked into then Italy. And now our family was in danger. It was a matter of days between the government finding out and putting our family's connection together. And now we were in danger and we needed to get out. But how and when? Because the borders were locked and no one could get in or out. My parents had tried to apply for an excursion in Germany and their visa was denied. So the only other option was to go into a different city and hope to apply for another excursion. But it was only for my mom and I. And as I'm sitting there and I'm 14 years old and I'm hearing what is happening, I'm thinking, what about my father? What about my little sister who was only four years old? And where will we go? And what will we do? And who do we know? Because that trip was to take us is to, into Istanbul, into Turkey, a Muslim country where we knew not one person, not a soul. My friends, our God has promised us. He said, when you know no one, I'm with you. So fear not, because I'm with you. Be not dismayed, because I'm your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you, and I will uplift you with my righteous right hand. So we applied. We applied for that excursion, and we did not know for two weeks whether or not we will be approved. At around three o'clock that afternoon before our trip was to take place tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine? not knowing at all what would happen. We got the phone call that we had been approved and that my mother and I would embark upon that journey. Our hope was to somehow 
after we got to Istanbul to connect ourselves to the embassy of Austria and request political asylum because my other aunt and uncle had defected to Austria. That was our hope. That was our plan. And so I remember that night, I couldn't sleep very much, but what I vividly remember was that morning, that following morning. Because my grandfather called us into the villa, veranda of my parents, and he called us there, and he said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray now. And I remember this man, who was a very stoic man, who had saved hundreds of Jews during World War II, and who was a courageous man, who I never saw cry <clears throat> that morning. He was shedding tears as he prayed that God would go before us and that somehow, some way, he will bring our family together again, entrusting us in his hands. Through the beautiful veranda of my grandparents, I could see the sun glistening as it was hitting the dew on the roses. And for everyone else, that day might have seemed an ordinary day, but for me, that day was the day when I would leave behind everything I knew, everything I owned, and everyone I loved, heading into the unknown. As we got in the car, I remember my father reminding me, remember, they're watching. They're KGB agents on that trip. You cannot cry. You cannot feel scared. <laughs> you cannot let anyone see anything, no emotion on your face. Before we got in the car, my parents, who were photographers, took the camera. And my dad, I watched my dad pull the film. That was when we still had film in the cameras, and not, not digital. He pulled the film out of the camera, took the film out, and inside that spool, he hid 300 Deutschmarks. We were not even allowed to have any other currency except Romanian currency. If anyone was found with foreign currency, they would be thrown in jail, and that was the least of their worries. I remember my father hiding that and then giving the camera to my mom, saying, be careful with this. You know what can happen to you if you get caught. As we got to the bus station, I was looking around, and I was hungry. It was early in the morning. I had not eaten breakfast. And my dad said, I'll go and get you something to eat. And um, as he left, because we were not supposed to actually embark on the bus for at least 30 to 45 more minutes, a few minutes after my father left, the tour guide said, we're going to be embarking early. There's a lot of traffic in the capital today, so we're going to be embarking earlier than expected. And so as those words came out of that woman's mouth, I just looked at mom and saying, what about dad? And mother just squeezed my hand as a harsh reminder, you are being watched. You need to be silenced. You cannot talk right now. It is too dangerous. So we got on the bus, and our seats were in the back, so I could see through the huge window. And I was on my toes trying to somehow, some way, with my eyes, bring my father back. And then the last person got on and the bus began to pull away. And as it was pulling away, my heart was tearing to pieces because I finally saw my dad running behind the bus with a little bag of breakfast in his hands, and his figure was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That was the image that my heart was left with when I left my country. We finally got to the border 
before leaving Romania. There was another check and suddenly I saw and watched militia men, armed men, storm the bus. They were around everywhere. And I thought, what's happening, mom, what's going on? And mom again just looked at me and squeezed my hand and I knew I had to be quiet again. And then I saw what was happening. Every single person in the bus was searched. Every piece of item, of clothing, of food, anything and everything had to come out of our luggage. And some of the militia men were throwing the contents onto the ground, searching for contraband. And I thought, oh God have mercy, if only they will choose to look at our camera. If only they will open that camera and find that foreign currency, what will happen to us? Finally, our name was called. And I remember mom just grabbing me and I was walking behind her, not really having strength, but she carried me because you know what? Our God carries us when we have no more strength, when we are unable to take one foot in front of the other. Our God is the Father that carries us. He tells us he will not leave us. He tells us he will be with us. And so she did that for me. And as we finally got there, which felt like an eternity, the militia man looked at my mother and said, which one is your bag? And mother pointed to the two bags. And he said, can you open it? And mother opened it. And would you believe that they did not touch a thing? Not one single thing. They said, thank you. You can go back to the bus now. You know, the Bible says that before we even call to him, he will answer us. And while we're still talking to God about our needs, he will answer our prayers. So miraculously, God blinded the eyes of those men and we finally got to the border of Turkey where we, finally, when, where we actually found out that none of us had passports. You see, you and I can hold on to a passport in the communist country of Romania the regime held your passport, and when you were allowed to go for a trip that was completely, um, completely um, secure and assured by them that you would return back because you would always have to leave somebody behind to assure you'd come back, then and only then, they would hold the passports for you. So never, ever, on any trip were you allowed to hold your own passport. So can you imagine? And so when we got to the border of Turkey, <clears throat> we assumed that the, that, that the KGB had our passports. Come to find out, we, had got, we have gone from Romania into Bulgaria and also ready to enter into Turkey and we had no passports. No one had passports. The only thing that the tour guide had was a sheet of paper with our names on it wanting to enter into a free country. Whoever can give you approval to enter into a country with a sheet of paper. An entire busload of people entering into a foreign country with, absolute, with absolutely no passports. And so we were held back there for hours on end. And you know what? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where fear paralyzes you, and yet throughout that fear, you can see above that and beyond that, and that was happening to me. I felt locked into that bus, and with my eyes through those windows, I could see freedom. I could almost feel it, but yet I could not touch it. I could not reach it. Finally, the tour guide said, you'll be going back. We will have to go back. The Turkish officials will not allow us to enter the country. I know my mother prayed, and she said, we need to pray. We need to pray. And we were praying silently, and my mother prayed. And I know that I was just asking God, God, please, not back. Not again. I don't want to go back. After hours on end, the tour guide came back and said, the Turkish officials said that they will make an exception this time around and they will allow us to enter into the country. 
And so we were able to get into Turkey. And when we got to the hotel, we were told that the hotel was overbooked. And not only that, that we would actually have to double up or triple up in our rooms with someone we had no idea who and how in the world would we be able to plan to move away from the group or anything at all or pray because someone else would be sitting in our rooms with us and sleeping in our rooms with us. I remember mother just saying, we'll pray, God is with us. Esperanza, God is with us. And we did, and God made another miracle. And somehow, some way, God allowed us to have a room for ourselves. And when we got to the room, we saw men posted every other room with glasses on, dark glasses, reading newspapers. And mother just squeezed my hand yet again. And when we entered into our hotel room, mother went straight to the bathroom, turned on the water loud, and whispered, this is where we're going to talk. And did you see those men? Those are not men reading newspapers. Those are KGB agents listening and watching our every move. I remember kneeling down with my mother on that hard stoned floor. And mother prayed and said, God, we are here. We don't know where to go. But you will make a way. My friends, I don't have time to tell you the rest of the story, but all I can say to you is that God is the way. And God did make a way in incredible ways. And the rest of that story is chronicled in the book called Hope and Present Danger. But what I want to talk to you about today is I don't know where you are in your journey today. I have no clue what you are facing today. I know what I'm facing. I don't know where your heart is today. I don't know what obstacle comes your way. I have no idea the torment, the fear that you are going through. But what I am going to tell you is that our God is alive and he is faithful. And when he says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, he really means that. And so, several days later, we found out that the entire group, we were supposed to actually go into the bazaar, and the bazaar, if you're familiar with Istanbul, the bazaar is really another metropolis under the metropolis of Istanbul. It's a huge market. And so our hope and our plan was to go into the bazaar and disconnect somehow from the group, get ourselves a taxi, and get into the uh, Austrian embassy. That was our hope. The entire group got sick with the flu except the two of us. God had his hands on us. And the night before we were ready to go into the bazaar, I remember packing a duffel bag, and mom looked at me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking my clothes. And she said, you can't do that. You cannot take anything with you. The only thing we will take is the camera bag. That's it. And God will provide. And that night, we prayed, and mother prayed, and asked that God somehow, some way, will protect us and help us to get away. So we got into the bazaar. We made our way out. Somehow, some way, we got into, into a taxi who was just circling around Istanbul, not knowing where the Austrian embassy is. We finally made our way to the Austrian embassy and requested political asylum. And they began to tell us, which we did not understand, that they could not help us. Because the immigration law stated that once you step foot in a country that is a democratic country and you request political asylum, you cannot bypass that country. So we were stuck in Turkey, in a huge place with no one to help us but God. I remember walking outside of that embassy and saying, now what? And sat on a ledge on the streets of Istanbul with my mother and saying, what now? 
I don't know how many hours passed and finally my mother said, maybe the bus will pass by so we can go back home. And at that moment I said, there is no turning back. There is no turning back. And somehow I saw someone who looked like a policeman and we crossed over and we connected with him and he was able to lead us to someone who spoke French where I was able to explain that we were requiring political asylum, that we did not want to go back. We were placed in a van, in a huge van, taken to the headquarters of police station, and then put in that van again, and there was no light whatsoever except one bulb dangling and just a little grill. And we, the only the light that we could see was through that corner grid. And I remember beginning to cry and saying, God, where are you, mom? They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us now. And mother said to me, look at the light. Focus on the light. If you focus on the light, your fear and darkness will dissipate. And after a long time, that seemed like forever, there were gates that sounded like gates hitting cement. And I remember bursting into tears saying, mom, They're going to kill us now, I thought. We had arrived in prison. And then the gates sounded again. Boom, boom, boom. And then the van came to a stop. And we heard footsteps. And then the door opened. And when I looked down, there was carpet. We were physically parked in a room. And right there, There was a man who spoke in Romanian and said, you are safe now. You can come out. You are safe now. So you see, my friends, our God is the God that will take care of us. He doesn't tell us that we will not fear. He promises us. He says, in this life, you will have tribulation. He warns us, but he promises us, take heart because I have overcome. So my prayer today for you is that you will be assured that the God who has taken care of all those amazing men and women in the Bible, the men who have been faithful, the women who have stood for God, Even when we were not faithful, that same God will be faithful to you and me, no matter what. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you because you are faithful. I thank you because what you said is true. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed because I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thank you, God, for that promise that you will always walk with us and you will hold us by our right hand and you will never leave us. May our hearts be encouraged by that promise and that assurance. In Christ's name, amen.